Hi, it's Dr. Lori. Today's episode of Rants and Raves has to do with those questions that I get asked over and over and over again. And I'm going to put them here so you don't have to ask them over and over and over again. So, all in one place. I've talked about this one so many times, so many times. As you all know, I love jewelry. I think jewelry is wonderful. I like the bling, I like the pearls, I like the whole thing. So, somebody writes in again, many people write in again about pearls. I still can't tell the difference between real and faux pearls. I think it's this, Dr. Lori. Is this right? If they're individually knotted, then I have real pearls. No. <laughs> Just because they're individually knotted does not mean that you have real pearls. I know you want it to be simple, but I've given you a lot of videos where I make it simple of how you can tell the difference between real and faux pearls, okay? They might have restrung the pearls. They might have actually wanted the pearls to be restrung for some reason, and they're restrung, but they're not real. Um, there's many different reasons why they might be individually knotted or individually restrung. Okay. The other thing is a lot of you are saying, oh, well, you know, there are, I, I don't know, I guess all real pearls are always worth more than all fake pearls. That's not true either. Many of the designer faux pearls, fake pearls, can be worth more than the low quality real pearls. Oh my gosh, really? Yes, really. So you're trying to go on these particular old wives tales, it doesn't really work. So. The other thing that I'm going to say to you that you all do, and I've seen you do it. One of you did it right in my class. I couldn't believe it. You know, rubbing the pearls against your teeth to see if they're gritty. That's not a good idea either. You don't want to do that. Don't rub them up against your teeth. And so, no, if they're individually knotted, that doesn't automatically say, oh, yeah, those pearls are the real thing. I teach you what the real thing is. I teach it to you on the videos and hopefully they're helping you. A lot of you guys are asking me these questions. I get this a lot. I get this a lot about glass and crystal. First of all, you're confusing what glass and crystal are. You're saying that you have etched crystal. You're saying you have etched glass. You're saying that glass is not crystal and crystal is not glass. One more time with this. Glass, 24% lead must be part of glass if it is to be deemed crystal. So 24% or more must be lead in glass in order to deem it crystal. Okay, that's how it works. Okay, so that's just a definition that you need to get. So confusing glass and crystal shouldn't really be that difficult, but I still keep getting this all the time, this, this comment, this question, this mistake from all of you. Okay, then there's this. Value should be impacted when you ting the glass. I have glass and I ting it and it makes a nice bell sound or I take my, my finger and I go around and I wet my finger and all of a sudden it makes this beautiful bell sound. That should impact value. Okay. I know you've heard this, this myth for decades. I know you've all heard this a lot. Oh, it sounds so good. It sounds so good. May sound good to you, may not sound good to somebody else. It's not about the sound. It's about the quality of the glass, which you can identify. Then somebody said to me, oh, you know what, what about the seams? I think the seams have something to do with it. I've explained to you why the glass is valuable and what to look for when it comes to glass, right? So again, the tinging of the glass is one of those old myths, old wives tale that lots of antique dealers used to do in the early 1900s to get you to go, oh, look, it sounds so pretty. It's beautiful. A lot of people still maintain that that's how they identify quality. It's not the best way to identify quality and it doesn't mean anything for value. So that's what you're looking at. I get this a lot too. I get it a lot and people don't understand it. Dr. Lori, you know, I want to give you a percentage once I sell this object that you've appraised. Well, it's a nice offer. It's nice of you to make this offer, but in my opinion, ethical appraisers do not get involved in the sale. And I still keep getting this question over and over again. They don't get involved in the sale because here's what happens. Because there are appraisers who aren't ethical who, in my opinion, who are doing this. I don't think they're ethical. Who are, in fact, saying, oh, yeah, I'll take a percentage from you once you sell it. Well, here's what the deal is. Basically, what will happen is they'll sell it for you. They'll sell it to their friend. Their friend will pay you something for it that's much lower than what it's worth. The appraiser knows what it's worth. The friend knows what it's worth. They're in cahoots. You get a percentage. Sure, you got that piece of that pie, right? You got whatever, and then the other portion of it goes to the appraiser and to the person who you sold it to. Okay. Then that person, with the help of the appraiser who's unethical, helps that other person that they 
connected you to, to sell it to, helps that person resell it for what it's really worth. You got the price, you got the value down here, it's really worth the value up here, and then they split and they end up getting much more than you ever got for the item. That's why I think appraisers should not be involved in the sale of items. They shouldn't act as brokers. They should be paid for their appraisal services so you get the right information. So that's when I go, don't complain about paying for appraisal services because the alternative is that they can get your object for a very low song. They could get it for very, very low, and then they could resell it in cahoots with their friend for what it's really worth. You're never the wiser. See, this is where I just sit here. I roll my eyes. I nod my head. I shake my head. I, I just can't even believe this. So someone writes in the comments, based on some appraisal that I've given, they said, a million dollar diamond is only worth a million dollars if somebody pays a million dollars for it. Yeah? <laughs> Why do you think in all of these videos and everywhere that I do an appraisal, I say, based on actual sales records, why that thing at the bottom, that, that blue banner at the bottom is called in media and TV, it's called the lower third. The lower third is there to show you these kinds of statements. Why do you think I make the video editors put in the lower third that says, based on actual sales records? Because that's exactly what it is. It's based on a sales record. My appraised value that comes out of my mouth is based on a sales record where something has sold. You know, yes, a million dollar diamond is only worth a million dollars if someone paid a million dollars. Sure, and guess how they do that? With a sales record. <laughs> I talk about this a lot too. The question is if I change out the mat or if I change out the frame of a work of art, does it devalue the piece? Many of you are afraid to change out works of art, to change out a mat or to change out a frame. Now, it's a good idea if you can and if it's in good condition to retain the original mats and the original frames on a work of art. However, many times you are doing something good if you are changing an old acidic mat or a damaged frame, a frame that maybe the corners aren't staying together because the frame is to protect the work of art and of course mats are for, are for the protection of prints and other types of art. So yeah, sometimes changing it will actually increase the value if you are getting acid-free materials instead of acidic materials like matte board. And if the frame is nice and sturdy and new, that will protect a canvas better than an old falling apart frame. So we get this a lot. Should I not change it? Should I not change it? I understand that you may not want to change it, but if it's damaged in some way, you probably should change it and that will impact value positively, not negatively get that question a lot. So I, I got this. This is one of the questions I get over and over ad nauseum because people don't want to pay for two things. They want to pay for two things as one thing. That's what I think when I see this. But so this person says, I was given two paintings and they are a pair. Would you charge me for each individual painting? I think, Dr. Laura, you should charge me just for one fee for both paintings because they were given to me together. Well, I don't know where you're getting this from, but, you know, here's an example for you. I gave my sister a foil pan of turkey when she left for th after Thanksgiving, and I gave her a Tupperware dish of, of turkey from Thanksgiving. I gave both those plates to her. They are different plates, right? Just because they both came from me doesn't make them a set. So there's a difference between something being a set and you getting two things from the same person. So just because you got two things from the same person and they're related because they came from the same person, that doesn't mean that they're a set. And that doesn't mean that that should actually be, they should be evaluated or appraised as a set. They should be appraised individually because they're two individual things. You know, the foil pan that I gave my sister is worth a different amount than the Tupperware that I gave my sister. Just because I gave it to her doesn't mean that that makes them a set because they came from the same person. Same thing with your paintings. The paintings have to be individually appraised or evaluated for many reasons. They're not a set, and that's just what it is. They're not a set. Well, I'm Dr. Laura. You know, I'm happy to go over these again with you, but hopefully you got it now. These, these, I've, been hearing, these I've been hearing about a long time, so here you go. That's Rants and Raves. Thank you very much for listening, for enduring my rant and my raves, and I'll see you next time.